It's almost Christmas. A couple more days, and this Sunday morning, we're going to be going into a special message about Christmas titled The Reality of Christmas, or probably rather, It's Really Christmas. It's Really Christmas. We're going to be talking about the reality of Christmas. Uh, and this is something that's kind of been on my heart and mind the past week or two. Uh, you know, the Lord is sort of a funny way of doing that. He begins to put things on my heart and mind uh, to teach stuff that uh, it's just sort of there. And I know that that's what it's supposed to be about. And I begin to think about it and consider it. But the world, and probably you and I as well, have been so busy around Christmas, around the holidays, so many things to do. Okay, well, we'll video chat at when it slows down because we know you're busy and we know we're busy. And then when we get a, a moment to breathe, December 25th and on, with some time off from work, hopefully we can do all the things that are probably the most important things to do that we're too busy to get around to do right now. But with that, the world is very busy and very intent and very purposeful on not saying Merry Christmas. They'll go around, uh, out of the way to say anything else other than Merry Christmas. And if it does, it's lumped in with other winter holidays, so to speak. Have a good holiday. Well, which one? I wonder when people say happy holidays to me. I go, is it National Donut Day? Because that's a great holiday. The winter solstice, tax day. No one says happy holidays in the middle of April. But with that, if we're so concerned about this holiday, and it's so funny they don't want to say it, but a holiday is a holy day. And I guess Donut Day is kind of holy, isn't it? But Jesus' birth wasn't really on Christmas as December 25th as we think about it. From what I understand, it was probably in late September, in the fall sometime. But Christmas, as we know it, comes from some amalgam of the Roman pagan holidays and what the Roman Catholic Church did when they took over in around 300 and they merged them all, is they took this pagan holiday of Saturnalia and they put Christmas on it. And so we celebrate on December 25th, not because there's a biblical mandate for it, but because there was actually a pagan one for it. But I digress. I think, you know, again, the point here is we're talking about the reality of Christmas. And I think this is one of those things that was even instituted by the quote unquote church that obscures the reality of it. We don't even celebrate on the right day. Easter, at least if it's coinciding with Passover, is the right day because Jesus died on Passover. But since we don't celebrate it on the real day, and we don't call it Christmas anymore, we just call it some generic holiday time of the year, and I get it, if you're not a believer, of course you're gonna say happy holidays. But if you're a Christian, I wonder, why do we do things exactly the same way the world does? Have we forgotten the reality of Christmas and what it's really all about? You know, we see that Christ isn't allowed, manger scenes removed, Kids' manger plays interrupted by protesters. And somehow you're doing something wrong as a person simply by saying Merry Christmas. Oh, you're not being inclusive. You're not worried about the other person's feelings. Well, actually we are. Christmas is the most inclusive holiday of all. It's God saying to the world, I'm with you. Come be with me. But when we do celebrate Christmas, we tend to talk about Santa, someone who's not real. Sorry if you're listening, who's, if you still think he's real. There's not some guy in red at the North Pole giving you all the gifts. I was wrapping gifts last night with my wife, and there's so many from all the grandparents and uncles and us, <laughs> and we have four kids, so it piles up quickly, and I go, I can't even get this one box of gifts. I don't know how Santa could do it for everybody. I know he's got a magical bag, I know. But as a kid, I told a friend on the bus in kindergarten that there was no Santa, and I hopped off and went and played Nintendo, and my mom got a call later that day, and I sorely got in trouble for ruining <laughs> the Christmas for him. I think he still believed. I think his parents talked him out of it. But random people we meet all the time in the store or out who are nice and friendly and well-meaning, they ask the kids if Santa is coming. 
And we're at the store, and Jacob goes, no, Santa's not real. <laughs> and we met a neighbor the other day, and she's like, is Santa coming? She had her kids there with her, and I froze. <laughs> like, what are the kids going to say? And they didn't really say anything. I think they kind of knew, like, I, I, thankfully my wife hopped in and was able to change the subject quickly. Otherwise, my kids might have ruined it for her kids and caused our new neighbor to not be so neighborly anymore. But am I totally against it? You know, I, I don't really know that I am. I don't have a, a stance on Santa. You know, I knew as a kid, and there was a couple of years I tried to pretend there was. My Uncle Chris would come to town and I'd put cookies out. But uh, it deep down, I knew it was vanity. I knew it wasn't real, and I just, just didn't care. It was Christmas. I knew it was about Jesus. And you know, we enjoy watching that Tim Allen Santa Claus movie. At least one and two. The third one wasn't so good. And it's sort of becoming a tradition. Although my kids know there's no Santa. Although we got a, a, a Christmas card from some friends in the area. And they were sitting with Santa at the mall or something. And Jake goes, wait, Santa's real? Because he saw our friends sitting with him. He said, no, but that's just like I dressed up. But at the end, we know it's not real. We know it's just something fun to do, perhaps. But I think the key is it shouldn't distract from Jesus. And for me, I, I don't see a point in telling my kids that Santa's real. I don't want to lie to them for some fun time as a kid that distracts them from the truth of Jesus. And then when they get older, they'll know that I lied to them. And then it'll set some sort of psychological precedent that what else did I lie about? And if we're lying on Christmas and Christmas is about Jesus, is Jesus even real? Is he just a fable? And I know maybe I'm getting too into it there, but I'm not sure that I am. Because where is that line? I believe that line is probably farther from happy holidays and ho, 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 and much closer like that star above Bethlehem leading us to, pointing us to, corralling us to that little manger in Bethlehem some 2,025 years ago. That was a long time ago. And history tends to obscure things. And we know the reality of Christmas and the truth of it and that's the reason we celebrate. And that's the reason we're truly thankful. Because honestly, we can be ungrateful about a lot of things, even good things. Even at Christmas, you didn't get me the gift I wanted. My wife told me a story when she wanted a guitar when she was little. And her parents gave her a little guitar pin and she was so broken hearted. They got her a real guitar, it was just some joke. But it broke her heart because she really wanted that guitar so bad. And I wonder what you and I really, really want the most this Christmas. I'm sure there's a lot of things. I know I already got some things. I already opened them up because I'm daddy and I can open my gifts early if I want. But, we say, but what do we really want? Deep down, what is it you want? Isn't it peace? Isn't it comfort? Isn't it safety? Isn't it joy? Isn't it happiness? Isn't it fulfillment? And we look to all these new things and these toys and these gifts and probably not the socks you and I might get or the Christmas pajamas that rip a week later because they're really cheap. <laughs> but don't we want deeper things than that? And aren't we just trying to fill the hole sometimes with the things we get and the things we give, perhaps trying to make up for our absence? But again, we say Merry Christmas as believers, as Christians, because we want people to truly have the joy that we have in Jesus. To have the joy that only Christmas brings. And not in the sense of all the happiness of giving gifts. It's a great time. I love it. It's the best time of the year. But it's just happiness. It fades when it's raining. It's not a white Christmas. And it goes away and all of a sudden you realize it's just January now. It's just winter and there's no gifts. That happiness fades. But there's a deeper joy there. Whether you believe in it or not, we're not trying to exclude you. We're rather trying to include you. That this Christmas is part of the greatest pair of holidays ever. I, I can't say Christmas without thinking about Easter. And I can't think about Easter without thinking about Christmas. Because they go hand in hand. You can't have Easter without Christmas. And Christmas doesn't have the same joy without Easter at the end. And they had 33 years to wait. We only have three and a half, four months to wait until Easter. 
And as we celebrate this Christmas, as we open a million gifts delivered by those Santas and brown and white trucks who work tirely this time of year, what really happened? What really happened thousands of years ago? If we remember in our Genesis study, thousands of years before that, God promised that he would send his Messiah, an offspring of uh, humanity, in part, to defeat the enemy and defeat the sin that separated us in the first part, that Christmas is about bringing the family of God back together. And that's really, I would love that for Christmas. I was talking to my dad the other day. I might, you know, I'm blessed by the things he gave us and to have them, have our family, but I, I'm going to be more blessed when we get to spend Christmas again together one day. But when it comes to Christmas, we tend to glamorize these stories and compartmentalize them into something special, which they are. And truly, it is a glamorous and glorious story. But I think like with our study through Genesis, we forget the earthly connection and the reality that these were the lives of real people with a real God. And he was doing something really amazing, intimate and special and the most wonderful surprise, so to speak, like Christmas morning. But he did it in ways that we probably wouldn't expect. Ways that when we really get down to it, that's probably why we, we glitter it up and we glam it up and we don't think about it. Because the world doesn't like to think about Christmas because if it thinks about Christmas and the real meaning of it, it has to think about Easter. You can't have Jesus without the cross. And if we don't want to think about the cross, well, let's just forget he was ever born in the first place. But let's not forget this morning. Let's turn to Luke. And we're going to flip back between Luke and Matthew. So Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 45. Luke 1, 26 through 45. I'm just going to grab a sip of water. It says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest. I'm sorry, I lost my place. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age and is now in the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the main servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to the city of Judah and entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is he who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. You see that this is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. That Mary was engaged to Joseph. And then this engagement in their society would last about a year. That they were really technically married, but they hadn't come together yet. They hadn't uh, fully been married. So it's like this, it was a little more serious than I think we take our engagement today. And it lasted about a year. And there's a lot of pictures in the Bible about the groom coming. And it's all related to this picture. But she was troubled. She's a young girl. She's an early teenager, perhaps. These are young people. They got married younger back then. But she loved God. She knew her frailty. When the angel appeared to her, it, it troubled her. 
what is this all about? She began to think. She didn't necessarily say anything to the angel. An angel could tell she was troubled and said, don't be afraid, Mary. You've got favor with God. And this was the promise of the Messiah, that he was going to come. That this offspring that was promised thousands of years ago through the seed of Eve, through Eve, is now coming through Mary. That Eve, a woman who was perfect by all stretch of the imagination, didn't quite love God and brought sin in the world. And this young girl, Mary, who probably wasn't perfect by the world standards, was perfect in God's eyes, in the sense, the same sense as Noah. She found grace in God's eyes, not because she was sinless, but because she loved God. And she looked to God and she trusted God, even at her young age. And she asked, how can this happen since I'm still a virgin? I'm not married yet. How can you be telling me that I'm going to be having a baby? And I think in some ways, like many other Jewish people of her day, they were expecting a political messiah. I think they expected this messiah just to be from the line of man, not to be part God, not to be God's son. But this baby would be half man, half God. It would be truly God's son. We say that the Spirit of God overshadowed her, overpowered her. And we see in this picture here something that's foreshadowed earlier in the Scripture, something even the enemy knew, trying to kill the babies like with Moses, that we see in that odd chapter in Genesis about the Nephilim, about the angels intermingling with the, the women of the earth, that there's this spiritual thing that's going on here. We even see raising from the dead happen several times in the Bible, and it happens when the prophet would lay out his body over the little boy or over the person who had died that overshadowed them. When God was in the garden, he breathed, breathed life into them. He was over them. There's this intimacy there, and not, this, not a perverted story, but a, an intimate story that God overshadowed her and somehow took that egg in her belly and tweaked the DNA and did it in a holy way to where this is now the Son of God. But without man, you know, the sin would pass down through man's line. But as she's told of this, she's told of another miracle in Elizabeth, her relative being pregnant. That this young lady who's betrothed, who's now in this, what the world would look on and say is like a daytime controversial TV Jerry Springer moment. She's told of her, her in a sense, her aunt. I'm going to call her aunt. It's her relative. It's not technically her aunt, I don't think. Who's pregnant. And what does she do? She runs out to Elizabeth's house. I think partly because she knows if people are going to start seeing that she's pregnant, there's going to be drama, there's going to be problems, what Joseph's going to do. I think also because of excitement that in this vision, knowing that this other lady, while it's not the same exact experience, it's a miracle in Elizabeth's life as well. And she knows that she can trust Elizabeth. She knows that she can turn to her. That Elizabeth loves God and Elizabeth would believe her. Elizabeth would know that she hadn't done something sinful. Elizabeth would care for her and minister to her. But that this plan for salvation for the entire human race was put in the hands of a normal, average young girl. But this average young girl loved God. That God could trust her because she had a relationship with him. And she begins to trust her aunt. And I think about my aunt and uncle who loved God and went in my wayward ways. I always knew they were praying for me. And I knew that even though I barely knew them, I knew that they were believers and they were genuine. And that was some anchor for me. This Messiah would be born soon. And she didn't have much support in her life. And, you know, especially having your first baby, you need a lot of support, but let alone in a tough situation like this. But what about Joseph during this time? What was Joseph doing? What was Joseph wondering? And I think perhaps it was Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Matthew 1, 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. And Matthew tells it in a little more dry, sort of analytical, tax collector sort of way. And he says, After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child with the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, remember, is her husband, but they're not quite married yet, 
uh, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you, marry your wife. I know it's a lot of fear when these angels come to people. We're dealing with so much fear as humans. And it's only the word of God through his messenger that can, that can ease that. And he says, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife. And did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. And I wonder, is Mary at Elizabeth during this time? And Joseph's thinking all this while she's away. And she told me she was pregnant. She said it was an angel. And she ran away to Elizabeth's house. And he's still working, doing his day job. Still got all the things, planning building and preparing for their marriage. He loves her, but she's pregnant and he knows it's not her baby. He's not so sure he believes what she tells him. He knows she loves God, but maybe she's gone off the deep end this time. Maybe she's so ashamed she's trying to cover it up. And Who did she cheat on him with? He waited all his life for her and They had been in love, and now he doesn't know. But he doesn't want her to be punished. He doesn't want her to be shamed in the town. He doesn't want her to even maybe face corporal punishment for it. So maybe he's not sleeping well. He's wrestling with it. He's a just man. He's a good guy. Joseph's a catch. Joseph's not like the other guys. Joseph loves God too. So God sends him an angel to quell his fears, and he tells him the truth. He assures his heart, and he says, Joseph, you name him Jesus. That even though this isn't your son, Joseph, I know you want a son, and having a baby boy, especially a firstborn, is a big deal. But he's your boy in a way, too. You get to be his dad through faith, believing that this is God's son and not some other man. And you get to give him, Joseph, the name that's above all other names, Jesus. You get to name him God is salvation. That this promise that's been passed down from generation to generation is finally here. And you get to pick him up and hold him and change his diaper and uh, hold him when he uh, scrapes his knee. And if they had bicycles back then, which they didn't, you'd teach him how to ride a bike. But that God is with us and your little boy. And he gets to be your little boy for a time, Joseph. Is that true for all our children? They get to be our children for a little time. But they're truly not ours like we dedicated Timmy. He's truly not ours. He's God's. He's truly God's son. God's the one who formed him. God's the one who made him. God's the one who chose which pieces of DNA would, would be dominant and not dominant. Which traits he would inherit and not inherit it. And more than that, he's had a plan for him since before the foundations of the world. I wasn't even sure if he was a boy or a girl. I thought he might be a boy, but God had plans for you since before the foundations of the world, buddy. But Joseph, you'll raise him, you'll love him, you'll watch out for him, you'll teach him things, you'll be his earthly dad. But when he grows up, Joseph, he will comfort you. He will teach you, and he will ultimately save you from your sin. We know that Joseph presumably dies before that day. We don't see him from the time when Jesus is about 12, the last story we see with him and his parents in the temple. And when he's 30, he takes on the public ministry. Something happened to Joseph. Maybe he died. I don't know. But Joseph believed God. And God gave him a word to believe that although the physical circumstances seemed more than doubtful. Come on, he didn't sleep with anyone and she got pregnant? No, he believed. He knew that this was God's plan, this was God's will, and he took it on, uh, probably with even more vigor than he would if it was his own baby boy. Let's loop back to Luke, chapter 2. 
I'll read seven verses and says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this census first took place while Quirinius was governor in Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. We know that Joseph probably lost friends. We don't see Joseph and Mary hanging out with family. They didn't believe it. Just like Jesus' brothers and didn't even believe he was God. Their family did. They were alone. They weren't even fully married yet and they were alone. And I think it's interesting we're about to see um, a, dec- a decree go out to all the world that even though this government, this power, this official thinks he's in charge, this is all prophesied. God, this is all part of God's plan. The, 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 the rich and powerful think they're scheming and planning, but God says, I knew it was going to happen, and I planned accordingly for it. And don't the rich and powerful in this world love to utter, utter decrees, love to make laws that affect the rest of us, sometimes in totally inconvenient, expensive, and burdensome ways. I read a, a joke about taxes the other day, and I don't think it's much of a joke. It, it just talks about all these taxes, that tax your coffin, tax your land, tax it, you know. I can't, there's so many taxes, I can't, basically anything you think of, they tax it. But I think a lot of these decrees just become, just because these people in power want to feel powerful, want to feel like they're doing something, even of worth, perhaps, in their mind, but it's burdensome. And a lot of times they're not even beholden to the decrees. It's just for the common people to follow. He, did, he didn't have to go anywhere. Caesar didn't have to go anywhere. But everyone else around the entire world had to get up, stop what they're doing, and go back to their hometown. Think about if my wife and family and I had to travel back to New Jersey or New York. Ugh, do I have to? Uh, or others around here, maybe they'd go back to California and stay there. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but what a burden. What an inconvenience. In life, stop your job, get up, travel, spend the money, go stay there, get counted, come back. All because this rich guy wanted to count everyone to show everyone how powerful he was. You know, 2020 is going to be a census year too. I don't know, do we answer that? (laughs) You know, uh, do I have to tell them I'm a citizen or not? But what a burden. And she's nine months pregnant. And they're alone. They don't have friends. They're not rich. They don't have a lot of money. They've got a donkey. No first class airfare. I saw a video today about first class airfare. The most expensive plane seat has three rooms. It's like a living room with a TV and a fridge and a big couch. And then it's a bathroom and you could take a shower up to a 10 minute shower. Your own bathroom and then a bedroom and they come in and they turn down the bed for you. This was not how they traveled. This was not how the son of God traveled. This is how the son of the most rich travel these days. This is not how God's son traveled to where he'd be born. No hotel room, a donkey, a side saddle for miles and miles and miles through rough country. No place for them to be comfortable. They're in a stable. They're basically in the city parking garage. I don't know if you've ever been to like a big city like New York. It's dirty. It's smelly. It's cold. They're there amongst the parked animals. There's no doctors. There's no medicine. There's no painkillers. They're poor. They're forgotten. They're in the back alley. This isn't a kingly place. This isn't where I would want my son to be born. We've done hospital tours before just to make sure we want to have our baby there. But a king would want the most advanced hospital. The one who made the decree would not have his baby born here. And yet the Most High, the one who has made the decrees for the very universe where the seas stop and the, the, how high the oceans go and how far the universe goes, he didn't decree anything but the most lowly place for his son to be born to a lowly couple that has no worldly influence or power or worth. But these, this couple, their lives would bear great spiritual significance in raising the Messiah for everyone. And what does it say for you and me? It says that Christmas is not a fairy tale. 
Fairy tales have happy endings. Fairy tales have flashy things and the prince comes and woo, the pumpkin turns into a chariot. Not here. It's not made up. It's not make believe. And it's not even what we see portrayed in Tiffany sets. The wise men don't show up for a, for a couple of years, for a little while. It's grim, it's gritty, it's real. For Mary, at least, it was full of a lot of personal anguish. They were lacking in provisions. They were outcasts from their very families and friends, their hometown. They weren't even at home when they had the baby. They were worried, they were dirty, they were burdened, and they were tired. And that's a vessel of earthly reality. That God is the great potter. He takes dirt and clay and makes something beautiful. And this situation is dirty. It's real. It's earthen. And let's go on and read a couple more verses. It says in verse 8, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in their fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be assigned to you. He will be a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. If you and I were to make up having the baby Messiah, we'd probably put a halo over his head, wrap him in gold. It wouldn't be this sign. Verse 13, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told to them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told to them by the shepherds and other lowly people. They had this, uh, God gave his message of his son being born to the lowliest people in their society. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. You know, it says glory to God in the highest and on earth peace goodwill towards man that in all of this it was the most glorifying event in heaven that this baby the son of god being born to this little girl who wasn't even totally married yet in this town far away from home not a nice place dirty in the back country was one of the holiest times in heaven if there could be such a holier time in heaven than another time and this event not the movement of the 60s, not modern humanistic globalism and fighting for change brought peace to the entire world. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, goodwill towards all people. That through a poor young couple in a poor old town in this forgotten place of the world where their worth to the people in power was just a number God birthed his precious son into the world to save us, to be with us, and to love us. To let us know that we're not a number to him. We're not an accident. Even if we were born out of wedlock, even if our parents didn't plan us, he planned us. Just like the Messiah. That we too have a royal destiny, no matter our earthly predicament. That God gave us the greatest gift his son, just to die for us. That this event all leads up to Easter. Because Easter and the cross was the only way that we might truly receive that peace and joy of eternal life. That little boy, that little baby, the joy of that and the Messiah being here, I'm sure in some sense would fade as the world got back to normal and Herod and Caesar were still in power and injustice still happened. But God promised peace. And that's something we fought for for our entire existence on earth. Since Cain and Abel, Cain wanted peace and he couldn't get it. Well, he didn't want it the spiritual way, so he tried to kill his brother. But that didn't give him peace. That gave him exile. 
And that's something we can never truly attain in life. And yet we fight for it. Where do wars come from? From our fighting and trying to get. But the way to truly get it is only through one way. And that's the way, the truth, and life. That little miracle baby boy who was born on that first Christmas day. And we can't get to peace if we don't go through Christmas. We can't have joy unless we first, like the shepherds, make haste to that manger and worship the baby born of God. So when you say Merry Christmas, when you and I celebrate every year, when we're up late buying last-minute gifts, anxiously checking to see if they'll arrive in time, if they have shipping fast enough, know that Jesus arrived just in time. Know that the gift of peace with God is real. It's not, some, you know, we always, I was talking to a friend the other day about buying things online. You're never quite sure of the quality of it sometimes. But the quality of God is, surpasses everything. The quality of his peace surpasses all understanding. And no amount of modernity can obscure this simple truth that God is love, that he loves you, and he sent his son as a gift to make sure that we know that God is with us, Emmanuel. And that's what Christmas is really about. And know that it's really Christmas, that when we celebrate this time of year, it doesn't matter if it feels like Christmas or not, it really is Christmas, and we can celebrate in the light of that. Amen? So God, may you bless us this Christmas as you have. May we go back to that manger in our hearts and our minds and worship with the shepherds and the angels and his parents. God, as they were blessed, uh, what, a, what a way to be a vessel of your son being born into the earth, God. But you call us to be even a greater blessing, being vessels of your Holy Spirit and vessels of the message of the, of the Messiah being born and dying and rising again and coming back. So come back soon, even on Christmas. May maybe that will we wake up to being awakened in your likeness. We love you, God. That's all we want for Christmas is you. Uh, and not like that song. <laughs> we love you, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. So may God bless you and keep you and his face shine upon you this Christmas day. There is a vineyard of the Lord. There is a vineyard for our soul. With all our troubles left behind the door, we drink first light until the door.